right okay, there. Okay, wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Calvary Chapel Cornerstone. Would you please stand with us? Awesome. It's good to see you guys all out here this morning. Uh, finally, a little break in the weather, right? Yeah. It's so good. It's supposed to be like 100 next week again, though. So, It's all right. Welcome to fall in California, right? Awesome. Well, let, let's pray and just thank the Lord for what a glorious day he's given us. Yeah. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you. We love you. We come by faith, Lord. God, we thank you for this day, this glorious day that you've made, Lord, and Father, we look so forward to meeting you here this morning and hearing your word, hearing what you would have to say to the church this morning, God. It's no different than what you told the church so many years ago, Lord. When your scriptures were written, Father, there's no difference. There's no change in, in man's heart, God. It's still the same. And so, Lord, it applies to every one of us here, Lord. So I pray, God, that you would, God, that you would empower me that you would empower us, this church here, by your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your love. Fill us, Father, that your love would overflow and that we could love those around us so much more than we do now. Lord, we need your power. We need your strength. We need your love, Father. We need you to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, Lord, that it may full, our cups may be full, Lord, that they may be overflowing, God. That, Lord, we would contaminate this world, what they would call contaminating, with our love, with your love. Give us so much love, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love, love You're a good, good father it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. One more time, you are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Man, he is so good, isn't he? Would you please stand with us? You know, that's what I pray this morning, too, for our church, for our fellowship here. I mean, as well as everywhere, but but our fellowship here, you guys are so special to us and to me. I love you guys so much. and I'm just praying for more love in this body. And that they would know there's something different about the Cornerstone Church here, that we're full of love and we have plenty to to give away. Amen.
Father, what a beautiful day we have before us, God. Lord, and as Brother Sal said, Lord, we thank you for this change in weather. It's not as hot right now, and we can be more comfortable, God, but Lord, let not comfort be our, our guiding our guiding light. But Father, may our faith lead us and guide us. May our faith rule over comfort. May our faith rule over complacency. Father, may our faith rule over fear. And God, may our faith in you cause us to rise up, God. Father, may it show the world that we are not led by circumstances, but we're led by the Holy Spirit, that we're led by the Father and the Son, the triune Godhead. And that, Father, our faith overcomes all fear. Father, it overcomes all circumstances. May we, sh may we show ourselves strong, steadfast, because of our faith, because we're grounded, we're grounded on the rock, we're anchored in Christ. And so may our faith cast out all fear. And we're just so blessed to be here this morning, Lord, and I'm so blessed to see so many people here this morning, God. And Lord, may that faith continue to grow. May more people come, not because it's about numbers, but it's taking a stand. It's showing the world who we are, or I should say who our Lord is, that we serve a wonderful master and that we want to come to his house, whether it's inside, outside, wherever it might be. Lord, have your way with us today. May your spirit have full reign in this place. May you bless your people, God, because they came. And Father, we look forward to the days ahead as you show us great and mighty things, God. Anoint our ears and our hearts and our minds today, Father. Be blessed in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Say hi to somebody. Amen. Well, how are you this beautiful morning? Great. Wonderful. Again, it's great to be with you and see all of you here. Uh, just a blessing. Um, again, just showing ourselves strong in the name of Christ. And again, we just uh, wish you a great morning. Open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. You know, in the times that we're living, and as I ask the Lord, you know, Lord, what, what book do you want me to teach from? Where, where, you know, where in the Bible should I go? And as I'm reading and I'm just trying to be sensitive to the Spirit, and as I read and God points out a topic or one thing and <clears throat> it leads me to another and then to another, and pretty soon I say, okay, Lord, I think I see where you might want to go. And so that's why I'm in Revelation this morning, because the church right now, as we all know, is, is under attack in many ways. It's hurting. It's uncertain about many things. It's full of anxiety. And we need to, we need to look at where we're at. We need to see what we're going to do about that so that it doesn't scatter us, but that it brings us together. But that means we have to examine ourselves individually and as a church. And it reminded me of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. They all had something going, but Jesus had one thing wrong with them. And he told them what it was. And that's what I want to look at today. And well, in the next uh, seven weeks, looking at the seven churches. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him 
to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and he signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore Christ to all things that he saw. I'm sorry, who bore witness to the Lord, to, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. This is important to hear and to understand and to take home with you. Blessed is he or she who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Blessed or happy are those who read these words, hear these words, keep these words that are written in it for the time is near. What time is that? The coming of Christ. Read and hear and keep the word of God. In chapter 1, verse 19, the angel, the angel told John to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. In chapter 1, John wrote the things which he had seen. That is the past, the vision of Jesus Christ. In chapters 2 and 3, John wrote the things which are present. Things concerning the church, the ministry of the church, and the witness of the church in the world. And then from chapter 4 onward, it's after the rapture, John prophesied those things which are to take place. That is future. After the church has been taken out of the world. After it's been raptured. And the future which is about to unfold before our very eyes after it is. Most of the revelation is described as things which must shortly come to play, uh, must shortly take place. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 and verse 45, there's a similar expression. And that is quickly or suddenly coming to pass. These things which must shortly take place are quickly or suddenly coming to pass, suggesting these events will happen quickly once they start. And I believe they've started. The idea is, is not that that event may occur soon, but that when it does, man, it's going to be sudden. The revelation was intended to guide God's servants or to show his servants, that is bond slaves, what was going to happen in the future. So chapter 1, verse 1, starts the basic outline for the whole book of Revelation. Its subject matter, which is Jesus Christ. Its purpose, to show future events associated with Christ's return. And the channel is the angel, and the writer is John. Then there's a threefold blessing. Notice in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 3, which I read to you, but I'm going to you know, break it down here. Blessed is he, singular. Each individual is blessed who reads, who reads. Secondly, blessed are those, plural. Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy. And third, blessed are those that keep those things which are written in it. Now, never, not everyone at this point of Revelation would have a copy of the book. So those who did and those who read it, in other words, those who, who read it and heard were blessed. But for both reader and the hearer, the most important thing is that they keep it, keep the things that they heard and they read. In other words, fulfill what's written, that is observe or pay attention to what was written, Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Notice where the blessing comes from. Keeping the word of God. Doing the word of God. Not just knowing it or hearing it. All three participles here. Read, hear, and keep are in the present tense. That means suggesting continued reading, continued hearing, and keep to continued keeping. It means to keep reading, keep hearing, and keep keeping or keep obeying. And here's the weird thing about all of this. 
that the only book in the New Testament that gives a special blessing to the reader is the one that is so often not read. Not read. Oh, it's too hard to understand. Oh, it's too... No. You know, we need to pray before we read and ask for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to teach us the book of Revelation, as well as any book. In chapters 2 through 3, the messages to the seven churches are referred to as the things which are in chapter 119. Now, many writers have found here seven periods in a row of church history with these seven churches. There are seven periods in a row of church history. J.B. Smith, a commentator, he gives a good summary of this interpretation. He says, the church in Ephesus pictures the early decline of vibrant Christianity at the close of the first century. The loss of its first love. The church in Smyrna describes the period of persecution in the second and third centuries. The church in Pergamos describes the union of church and state under Constantine in the 4th century with its following religious and moral corruption. The church in Thyatira describes the domination of the Roman hierarchy from the 5th to the 15th centuries. The church in Sardis points to the days of Reformation in the 16th century when a few names had not defiled their garments. The church in Philadelphia speaks of a period of orthodoxy and evangelism by such leaders as uh, John Wesley and George Whitefield in the 18th century, at the time that all nations of the world presented open doors for the reception of the gospel. Last, the church of Laodicea. It shows the end-time apostasy in just the same words used as concerning the last days by Jesus and the apostles Paul, James, Peter, John, and Jude. This apostasy started with German destructive criticism of the Bible in the 19th century, and it's reached the alarming stage represented by, many of you may remember, I grew up in the 60s, and I remember in 1965, they began to claim that God is dead. In the 60s, when they declared, God is dead. And that thought and belief has continued to grow to this very day. These seven churches, seven is the number of completeness. So these seven churches represent all churches today. The most unpromising churches. These churches, they looked good. And they looked strong on the outside. But they were compromising. And they were morally corrupt. That's why we must look at our own church. As well as other churches need to examine themselves. Where do we really stand this morning? Jesus said they were physically weak. They were very deficient. Though persecuted. And it was just a matter of time before they break down and scatter everywhere. And not sure that they'll survive for very long. Do you feel that way this morning? In spite of all of that, Jesus was in their midst and he's in our midst this morning. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to the churches. And he's promising great blessings to those who overcome. These churches were real churches representing their day, but they still represent our churches this morning. Some of the problems of these seven churches are in our churches right now, this very minute. And their problems... Then, the problems of, this, of, of the seven churches then are our problems today. And what Jesus said to them applies to us now. 
with the same seriousness and the same purpose. Now, when people are looking for a church, and you can, you know, ask yourself over the years, the different churches that maybe you've attended and you looked for. When people are looking for a church, it's hard to know if it's the church for you. A lot of people have different checkpoints that they look for, you know, in a church. Well, I like the pastor. Does he teach the Bible biblically? Or does he tell stories and a lot of jokes? Oh, he makes me laugh. Because there are those who like a pastor that tells jokes, makes them laugh, and spends a lot of time talking about his vacation and everything else and very little on the word. What ministries, what support groups are available at the church? What's their vision for the community and the world? Can I get involved? Now, when people are looking for a church, many look for a, a, a nice, impressive building with all the creature comforts, soft chairs, air conditioning, convenient parking, big choir, pretty robes. So you find just the right church. It meets all of your requirements. You've checked off all of the things that you're looking for on your list. You can't wait to go. You sit down. You go in there. It's not long before you realize this church is dead. Got a nice building. Big choir. Comfortable chairs. But the spirit is dead, and so are some of the people. Then on the other hand, there's the humble church. Not so big. Not as impressive. Maybe the carpet needs a little replacement. Needs some repair. Seats are a little hard. You could use a little tender loving care. But man, the word of God is being preached. The people are being taught there. They're growing. They're becoming more like Christ. The people are getting saved. Lives are being changed. People are being delivered from their sin. And they're being healed of various illnesses. And the people are loving. And the congregation is growing. The church that we think is rich and perfect materially is poor spiritually in God's eyes. And while the poor church in the Lord's eyes is really rich. You see, only Jesus, who is the head of the church, truly knows the condition of the church. Because Jesus sees what's going on inside. Because he walks in the midst of the church. He doesn't see just what's going on outwardly. No, Jesus looks at the church kind of like a when you go to the doctor and they give you a CT scan, Jesus sees everything. Jesus can see through the impressive frills and the ruffles and he sees the true condition of the church. Oh, there's a bad spot right there. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation here, Jesus gives all seven churches a CT scan, if you will. And it shows everything from head to toe. And then he tells them through these special seven messages to each church what he sees in comparison to what they see and think. He tells them what their real condition is. But these messages are intended for all the churches today to read and benefit from them. So if these messages are for all churches, who's the Holy Spirit speaking to? The building? The furnishings? Every individual in this parking lot and right here. You know why the church is not 
in there. Today is right here. The church is you and the church is me. The church is each individual believer. You and I, you and I make the church what it is. If you don't like what your church is, then you and I maybe need to look at ourselves. We make up the church. As members, we are the ones that determine the spiritual life of this congregation. So here's your part and my part. While we are reading the messages in chapters 2 and 3, we need to look at our own individual hearts and we need to apply the messages as they apply to us, where they're needed. Jesus said in chapter 2, verse 7, here, he said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So the first letter is to the church of Ephesus. It was a zealous church, but it was a loveless church. So turn with me now to chapter 2. We're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Let me read verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Each of the seven messages starts with a personal description of Jesus Christ. Taken from the vision of Christ given in chapters 1, verse 12, 16, and 20. This first letter is addressed to the angel or messenger of the church at Ephesus. The Greek word is agalos. It's where we get our English word angel. But the same word is also used in scripture for human messengers. That is one sent to announce. Here, it's used here as, as a human messenger. So this was a human messenger that this letter was addressed to. Now, it might have been the pastor or, or the leader of the church here at Ephesus that was supposed to deliver the message to the congregation. The Lord has the seven stars, but he has them as the one who holds them using them in his power, even as they are in his right hand, which is a sign of his majesty and omnipotence. He's to use the seven churches in his power. All the true ministers of all the churches are held in the hand of Jesus Christ. As he walks in their midst, verse 1 says, which is the idea of majestic activity in the midst of the churches that he holds the ministers in his hands. When John wrote this letter, Ephesus was the leading city of the Roman territory of Asia. At the west end of Asia Minor, it was a great seaport. Caravans on Roman roads from the north, east and south, they would meet there. They'd meet there to load their cargoes on ships sailing west for Corinth and far away Italy. Ephesus was a thriving city, full of life. It was the gateway of Asia. At the same time, it was the highway to Rome. And in the early 2nd century, when Christians were being shipped to Rome to be fed to the lions, Ignatius called Ephesus the highway of martyrs. Now, politically, Ephesus was a free city. So it enjoyed a lot of self-government. Religiously, the city of Ephesus was the religious center of the worship of Diana and Artemis. And the temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the world. Ephesus was called the light of Asia. Yet it was a pagan city and it was filled with the darkness of heathen superstition. Diana was worshipped more than any other idol. 
and part of their worship consisted of the grossest kinds of immorality and sensual and drunken orgies. A commentator named Sweet, his last name Sweet, said this, the city, speaking of Ephesus, the city was a breeding ground of cults and superstitions, a meeting place of east and west where Greeks, Romans, and Asiatics bumped into each other in the, bumped into each other in the streets. And because of, because of its important location, Paul spent more time there than any other place on his three missionary journeys. The effectiveness of Paul's mission or his ministry there is mentioned in Acts 19 verse 10. Where it says, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You see, Paul's ministry was to get the gospel out. And for two years, they heard the gospel of Christ preached. Paul's preaching there was so effective that it caused the sales of the little idols of Diana to drop in sales. Paul's teaching that Diana and these idols weren't worthy of worship, it caused a riot, and they ran Paul out of town. Look at verses 2, 3, and 6. <clears throat> Jesus says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 6. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Before Jesus rebukes his church, he graciously commends them for the good things that they did. God will never forget what we've done for him. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, I know, I know. But that would make me kind of nervous if Jesus walked up to me and said, I know. Oh, what does he know? What he tells the church is based on what he knows. Not what was passed on to him. Jesus doesn't get secondhand information, thirdhand information. It's not like Jesus, well, you know, I heard your, uh, uh, your pastor was praying the other day and he told you guys that, you, that, that you were being naughty. That's what I heard. You know, he doesn't say, oh, you know, one of my angels sat in on your Sunday service and he came back and told me what he saw. Remember what we read? Jesus walks in the midst. He's here and he sees all that's going on right now in our hearts. Jesus walks in the midst of the church. It's his church. He's the head. So he sees everything and he knows what's really going on in the church. Christians think many times they can hide things from God. Or that he doesn't notice. He doesn't notice because they think, he, well, he doesn't do anything right away. He doesn't, he's not doing anything. I've been doing this for a while. God doesn't just, uh, does, just doesn't see what you want him to see. He sees it all. He sees and he hears everything that we do and he knows why we do it. So the first thing Jesus does here at the church of Ephesus, he commends them for their works. Works, works, works. He says, and your labor... A lot of work and a lot of labor going on. Barclay defines this labor as to the point of sweat and exhaustion, the kind of toil that takes all of your mind and muscle that man can put into it. These guys were working hard. They were putting all of their mind and all of their sweat and all of their muscle into this work. So he says, I know you're hard workers. Then he says, I know your patience. Patience here is talking about a steadfast endurance. Not a hopeless patience that hopelessly accepts things and bows its head when trouble comes. This patience is the courage that accepts sufferings, hardship, loss, and turns them into grace and glory. 
So Ephesus had works. Busy all week. Schedule full of different ministries. It was hard working at all of their ministries. They were patient. That means they just kept going even under the toughest conditions. So this church had all of these qualities, and yet it was empty of spiritual life. And so can an individual be empty of spiritual life. The church at Ephesus wasn't just a hard-working church. It was careful when it came to discipline. Verse 2 says they couldn't bear those who are evil. They weren't like the Corinthians. The church at Ephesus, they wouldn't tolerate sin in their congregation like many do. So the Ephesian church was commended for hating what was morally bad as well as what was spiritually wrong. The Ephesian church, it was, it was a separated people. They were a separated people. Because they carefully examined the visiting ministers to see if they were for real. Ephesian Christians separated themselves not only from false doctrine, but also from false works of God. The traveling apostles in, in these days, Paul's days, caused a problem in the earlier church. That's why John said in 1 John 4, 1, he said, try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Just because they have reverend or doctor or pastor or whatever their title might be, you check them out. Check out their doctrine. Try the spirits whether they are of God or not. The word didache meaning teaching. Didache was an ancient uh, Christian manual of, of instruction. Also called teaching of the twelve apostles was probably written in Syria during the first century. Some say it was during uh, it was later about the middle of the twentieth century. The Didache, it was a list of moral teachings of instructions on the organization of Christian communities and of regulations pertaining to, uh, pertaining to principles and ceremonies prescribed for worship. It contains the oldest recorded prayers for communion with God and directions on baptism, fasting, prayer, and the treatment of bishops, deacons, and prophets. It tells how the traveling ministers were to be tested. And how every apostle who, apostle who comes to you, it said, let him be received. Go ahead and re receive him. Okay, receive him as unto the Lord. But, here's the test. He shall not stay more than one day. But however, if there be need, then the next day. Okay, but if he stays three days, he's a false prophet. In other words, he's not to sponge off the hospitality of the church. Let him stay one day, invite him in, show him the love. Two days if necessary. But that third day, he's gone. He's not to sponge off the church. Jesus said this in verse 3. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. New Living Translation. You have patiently suffered with me, for me without quitting. The Ephesian Christians, they were tireless workers. The Ephesian church is also commended because notice in verse 6 what it says, it hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now nobody knows for sure who the Nic Nicolaitans were, who these people were. But it, it seems they were like a, a sect, a cult. Now their name meant conquering of the people. Nicolaitan comes from, the, from two Greek words, nikau, nikau, uh, it means to conquer, and laos, the people. So Nico, laos, to conquer the people. That was the Nicolaitans. They were the initiators of the priestly change of command placed upon the people. They would lord over the people and rob them from their freedom in Christ. 
God didn't hate the, now God didn't say he hated the Nicolaitans. He hated what they did. Because it puts some men closer to God than others. God doesn't want anyone to feel far from him. He wants every man and woman to feel close to him. God doesn't want you to feel that you have to go through some man or woman to get to him. He wants you to go directly to Jesus who has opened the, who has opened the door to every individual and he doesn't want anyone to stand in your way of coming to him. Jesus said, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We all have access to the Father through His Son, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So the believers at Ephesus had all these things going for them, and they did them all for Jesus' sake. It says, for His name's sake. But, but, the one, Jesus Christ, who stood in their midst, he saw through all of these good works and he looked into their souls and he saw things just a little bit different. Look at verse 4. Nevertheless, in other words, in spite of all these wonderful things that you do, I have this against you. Notice here it is, that you have left your first love. Wow. Wow. It, I mean, how in the world can you do all of these wonderful things for God, for Christ? And, and, and then Christ say, well, you know, you left your first love. The first love. So he rebukes him for it. Jesus found just one thing wrong with a congregation at Ephesus. So see, this is important to look at because of all of these good things, sometimes people think, well, I've done all of these wonderful things. I should be okay. I should be all right in the kingdom of heaven. But there's this one thing that Jesus says, you've left, and it's the most important Again, they, oh, they were active. They were hardworking. They were patient. Yet, that church lacked love. And I agree with Brother Sal as far as uh, uh, this church. I believe it is a very loving church. And when we've had visitors and speakers, conferences, the way the, those that served, served the, the, the people that were here, I always got the compliments That, man, you have a loving church. You have a serving church. And I pray it continues that way. But I would tell you, anyway, if you get a chance, you know, tell, tell those who are serving what you said. I think that, you know, they, they'd love to hear that. I always get the blessing of hearing it, yet the ones who are doing it, you know, they, sometimes they don't know. That first love was missing and there was that devotion to Jesus that you so often see when you first get saved remember that Kathy and I talk about it all the time remember when you had to wait in line to get to church you had to park down the street you had to get there a half hour early and then you had to get in and fight the rush to get a seat And man, you couldn't wait till Sunday. You couldn't wait till Wednesday. You couldn't wait till Sunday night to get to church. You're on fire. It's personal. You were telling everybody. You're excited. You're uninhibited. You're not afraid to say, I'm a Christian. I got saved. <clears throat> and to show it. It's important to, <clears throat> excuse me, it's important to understand that the Ephesian church, they didn't, notice it says they left their first love. This is important to understand the difference. They didn't lose it. They didn't lose their first love. They left it. The word left here means to let go, to send away, to leave, to give up, to abandon. 
And I forgot to mention, but that's why I entitled the message this morning, Leaving Your First Love. Or leaving the one that you love. Not losing them, leaving them. To let them go, to send them away, to give up. All of these expressions suggest, here it is, a willful neglect. It was a willful neglect. The early church did not get off track when it came to the word of God. They were, they were right on in the word. They got off track in their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They got sidetracked. Maybe they were too busy with all of the works and forgetting about the one they were serving, the one they were doing it for. A lot of Christians who abandon their relationship with God are knowledgeable of the Word of God. They know the Word of God. But this is the problem. They stop pursuing their relationship with God. Look at verse 5a. Jesus said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. He gives them the remedy now to get back on track. The first thing you need to do is remember. The first step back to your first love to God is to remember. What do you usually do or what does somebody usually tell you when you've lost something? Let's say your keys. Well, remember where you last had them? Do you remember where you last had them? Jesus says, here, remember, remember the former days of blessing, the former days when you were so fired up and you couldn't keep your mouth shut. So fired up that people thought you were still doing drugs. And I remember that. Sharing one time with somebody. I was talking so fast, they, th they thought I was wired up. I said, no, I'm just excited. They, they just, you know, you just, you just can't help yourself. They're knowledgeable. But they stop pursuing God. Remember those early days. Remember, remember the former days of blessing. This church here did not stumble. It had fallen. The church didn't stumble. It had fallen, and it was down for the count. And to correct any departure from God, the first step is to go back to the place of departure. The Ephesians were exhorted to remember their enthusiasm. Jesus was saying, look, remember that enthusiasm you once had in your heart for me. Remember the causes of it. Yes, reading the word of God, going to church, having fellowship. The wonder of your newfound salvation and the joy you had and the satisfaction that you had in Christ. The new desires that you had that took away the old desires that enslaved you. So often spiritual desertion, whether of mind or in the heart, comes from forgetting what you used to know and do. Just slacking off. It doesn't take much and it doesn't take long, I tell you. The second step, look at verse 5 again. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Here's the second step. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The second step is repent. That means to change the mind. They were now to have a different attitude towards Christ and they should start again that passionate love that they once had. Repent, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me that I have been so lax in my relationship with you and, and keeping it going with you and not reading and not praying and not going to church uh, uh, regularly. even though it's outside, regularly. And then the last step again, returning to that place of departure from God, 
uh, is notice it's return. Remember, all right, the first word, repent, change your mind, seek forgiveness, and return. In other words, do your first works. This means believe and obey. A true love for God is always proven in the works that it produces. Go back to doing the things you were once doing. This suggests restoring the original fellowship that was broken by our sin and our neglect. For the believer, this means prayer, reading your Bible, meditation, obedient service, and worship. Now, it takes some effort on your part to keep this relationship with Jesus Christ going so it can be the best that it can be. And again, your, your marriage relationship, for those who are married or want to be, understand that, that what you put into it, what you put into it is so important to keep it going. But when you stop, You'll experience the effects. People say when they end up splitting up, well, I, I, I didn't love him anymore. I didn't love her anymore. No, that wasn't the case. You quit loving them. You quit. Because you have to put, an, you have to put effort into it. And when you do, it pays off. I didn't feel the love. The Bible says love isn't a feeling. It's, a, it's an act. I do it because I love that person. It's not whether I feel like it or not. I'm doing it in obedience to God. And when you obey God, you get rewarded. God does not, God does not reward disobedience. Now, you should know that as a parent. You reward your trial for disobeying you, disobeying you? No. Our Father does the same thing with his children. Blessed are those who keep my word. Like I said, it takes effort on your part. Relationships take effort, and we know relationships are fragile, easily broken. If the Ephesian church refused or, refa or failed to remember, to repent, or to return, if they failed to do the first works like Jesus warned, notice again what he says in verse 5b. He says, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The church in Ephesus was in danger of losing its light. And they could expect judgment and the removal of the candlestick. Jesus Christ. He would remove the church as a testimony for Jesus. And that's what Satan is trying to do. Is right today, he's trying to remove our testimony. And to me, the, you, you hear our great testimony this morning as people are driving by and walking by and, and watching. You have great testimony to the love of God and the power of God. And that's what the Lord did to those who lost their first love. He removed his candlestick. He removed the, his light. And the, I say the Lord did just that. Today, Ephesus, this once mighty city, is nothing but a pile of ruins. Think about that. The Caster River, which made uh, uh, Ephesus, the great seaport that it was in its day, it is now a harbor that's filled with silt. Nothing can grow there. Now it's just a swamp of reeds because no light is shining there anymore. Last part, look at verse 7a, the first part. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's an invitation and the promise. The invitation is found in each of the seven letters. Though the message is addressed to the church through its pastor, the individual, the individual believer is urged to respond to the exhortation as well. God speaks to those who listen. 
And then there's the promise to the overcomers. Look at the second part of verse 7. He says, To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The promise to the overcomers is to be expected by those who are true followers of Christ. John asked this in 1 John 5, 5. Who is he who overcomes the world? Here's his answer. Who overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The word believe there means obeys. Believing and obeying are the same thing because if you believe something, you'll do it. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God will overcome this world. Will overcome whatever we're dealing with. 1 John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. In other words, those in the Ephesian church who are genuine Christians, and by this believing and obedience, they had overcome the unbelief and sin of the world, and they were promised the right to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Remember, Adam blew it when he was tested. And God cast him out of the garden, away from the tree of life. But here it's promised to those who will be faithful in their temptation. We can enjoy this blessing now and even more in eternity. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In closing... The Ephesian church was made up of enthusiastic believers. But they were careless believers. They were believers who quit loving Jesus. You must ask yourself this morning, have I quit loving Jesus? Am I just going through the motions? Am I just busy? Have you neglected your first love? Then if so, remember, repent, return, and do your first works. Father, thank you so much for your word, Father. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you for all that you are. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you're doing, God, and all that you're going to do. And Lord, help us through this first message this morning, God, to not be careless in our relationship with you, Lord. <coughs> Father, to, to, to dive in head first, God, to not look back to not look around, but to look up to see you seated on the throne. Father, help us to get back to our first love, to that excitement, God, to that joy, to that satisfaction that brought us to a place of confession and repentance and receiving of Christ. God, may you have your hand on each one here this morning. May you bless them, God. May they, may they take this word to heart. God, I pray that next Sunday, Lord willing, God, we'll have even more people here, God, as they reach out and ask people to come and witness and share. And God, watch your church grow in glory of you, God, to glorify you. Father, we thank you. We give you praise and honor. And Father, I want to pray for the offering, God, before I step down, God, that you would bless the offering. We thank you for the giving and the love that the people have for you. And I thank you for your faithfulness, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to, uh, as I mentioned last week, we're going to spend the evening in prayer. Had a great time of prayer last time. We have a lot of things to pray for, so... Come and join us for uh, an intimate time of prayer.
And also, uh, next Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at the Church of Smyrna. It was the persecuted church. God bless you guys. Amen. Could you please stand with us? Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Amen. Share the love of Jesus today with somebody. Amen? Amen. God bless you.